Today, we continue a time-honored RL tradition of recognizing and celebrating the particular faith lives of members of our community. As a school, we encourage the pursuit of truth and we advocate exposure to a broad and deep wellspring of knowledge. Of course, knowledge of the world's great religions falls within that immense but worthy band. In doing so, we pay homage to the fact that we are a school that gathers all kinds of boys committed to understanding and celebrating differences, including differences of faith that contribute to our whole. Knowing about various religions and affirming the faith lives of one another are both worthy pursuits, but it is also in hearing about and from the witnesses to these different faith traditions that our own journey toward meaning and fulfillment can be most hopefully informed. With us this morning to share his story and his experience of the Hindu faith is Swami Tayagananda. The Swami is a monk of the Ramakrishna order. He is head of the Vedanta Society in Boston and he also serves as the Hindu chaplain at MIT and Harvard. He became a monk in 1976, soon after graduating from the University of Bombay, India. He has presented papers at various academic meetings and offers lectures and classes at the Vedanta Society, MIT and Harvard, and other colleges in and around Boston. Prior to coming to the United States, Swami Tiagananda was for 11 years the editor of the English language journal Vedanta Kasari, based in Kanai, India. He has translated and edited 10 books, including Monasticism, Ideals and Traditions, Values, The Key to a Meaningful Life, and The Essence of the Gita. He acknowledges that some people in the West find his name unusual. As he explains, Swami is the epithet used for Hindu monks, and the word means master. It points to the ideal of being a master of oneself or being in control of oneself. The second part of his name was given to him when he received his final monastic vows. Tiagananda is a combination of two words, Tiaga and Ananda. Tiaga means detachment or letting go. Ananda means joy. Taken together, the word means the joy of detachment. It points to the ideal of letting go of all the non-essentials in order to focus on and hold on to the essentials. Our guest is an exemplar of those worthy goals. And we are delighted to welcome to Roxbury Latin this morning, Swami Tiagananda. Thank you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great joy to be here. And I'm grateful for having been given the opportunity to share with you um, a few, I, few ideas about the festival called Diwali, the festival of lights, which the Hindus all over the world celebrated uh, last weekend. The Diwali is a, the word comes from the Sanskrit root div, which means to shine. And Diva means a light. And Avali means a, a row of lights. So Diwali means really a row of lights. So this is among the many festivals that Hindus have. This is the probably the most famous or the most popular festival. A little bit like uh, like Christmas, just like a Christmas. There's a whole atmosphere changes throughout here. Uh, same way it happens in the Indian subcontinent. Um, it's often been as a symbol of of knowledge of goodness of victory and historically this is the this is the festival is based on a on a story in in indian history so there was a king called rama and the story of his life is known as the ramayana most hindus i would think today get to know about the tradition not so much by going to the study of the philosophical texts, but more through the epics, such as the Ramayana. There's another one called the Mahabharata, in which the another great text of the Hindus called the Gita is a part of that text. So Ramayana is the story of Rama, and he was such a great king, but he was exiled to the forest by his stepmother. And then we read in the in history 
that he went there with his wife and his brother. And when they were in the forest, there was an evil king or the tyrant. Uh, he came and then kidnaps his wife. And he was already tormenting all the people in that area. And so then Rama goes and there is a, a it's a very elaborate, elaborate uh, story. And then Rama goes and, and vanquishes that, that very tyrant, evil uh, person. His name was Ravana. And so when he then, after vanquishing Ravana, who was considered the symbol of evil, Rama returns to his kingdom and was coronated king. And so that day of his coronation, when the entire kingdom celebrated with lights and joy and distribution of sweets, and that eventually evolved into what today has become the festival of lights, Diwali. And then this King Rama was so good, so ideal in every way. All the qualities that we consider to be ideal, something that every one of us might aspire to have, to be a good, successful human being. Rama had all of those qualities. He was honest, he was truthful, he was unselfish, he was kind, he was helping. And because his qualities were so adorable, so inspiring, that many people saw him, even during his time, and certainly afterwards, as not just an ordinary human being, but uh, either a human being who had ascended, transcended all the human limitations and become divine, or a descent of the divine himself. So many Hindus worship Rama as an incarnation of God. And there are temples to Rama all over the, the Indian subcontinent. In fact, a few years ago, I visited um, Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, many of the Southeast Asian countries. It was amazing to see the story, this story of Rama, so popular even there. And there were many temples to Rama, even in Indonesia, which is actually a Muslim majority country, and then Cambodia. The idea is that religious traditions do not remain confined to specific national boundaries. There is something, there is a power of truth, there is a power of honesty, integrity, which, which appeals to us no matter wherever we are. And so while the historical details themselves might be confined to a certain part of the world, a certain culture, a certain religious tradition, the values that that person and that festival connected with it are something that resonate with head and heart everywhere. If we kind of lift them out of those historical details. The festival itself, as it is celebrated among Hindus, they have worship, um, they prepare sweets, they visit their family, friends, and, and then there's lots of, um, um, what, what gets called there as, as these uh, light and sound and fireworks. Of course, here, here we have fireworks only on the July 4th and on, on first night on the New Year's Day. But, but this is the time if you happen to visit the Indian subcontinent, find lots, lots of fireworks every night. Goes on for almost three or four nights, it continues. Now, external light which is symbolized through all these festivals is only an external manifestation of the internal light. And I, I said that light is seen not only in Hinduism, but in many religious tradition as a symbol of, of, of knowledge, a symbol of joy, a symbol of the divine, as opposed to darkness, which is seen as a symbol of ignorance, symbol of, um, uh, something that is not good, symbol of sometimes even it is seen as 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 the um, as evil. Sometimes you will see even in the uh, what we could say is modern mythology. If you see even 
the stories of, of Harry Potter or, or even Star Wars and stuff like that. You will always find the, the dark lord or, the, or, the, or the, the, the symbols are always, light is always get gotten associated with something that is, that is uh, divine and something that is knowledgeable. So I, I want to say a little bit about the light within. Just as there is light outside, what about the light within? Now, Hindus have often seen that the human personality, just you and me, if we ask ourselves, who am I? What am I really? When I, and usually when we want to see how we are, we stand before a mirror. And what we see in the mirror is, is our own body and how we look. And we usually stand before a mirror to make sure that we are presentable to the world. But we also know that there is more to us than, than just the body. Clearly, body is something that is visible to everyone. Everyone can see me, but not everyone knows what is going on inside me. My thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, that's something that is visible only to what's going on in my head. And even if, if I have to go to the hospital and if I have to undergo a surgery, there are lots of things in me that even a surgeon will not find when my body is cut open. The surgeon can only see the physical part of me. But what about the mind? The mind is as much a part of my personality as the body is. So there is the mind, there is the intellect, there are these emotions, there are these feelings. All of these are invisible. They're not visible the way my body is, and yet they are a part of me. So this, as I am today, a person, as a person, I am this visible body plus the invisible mind and intellect. Now, is there anything more in me besides the body and the mind? And the Hindu tradition teaches that in addition to the body and mind, there is a third, and, and to express it in English, I probably might just use the word spirit, meaning it's, it's an entity, it's something that is different from the body and mind, but yet the core of my personality. The body and the mind can be seen in the Hindu tradition as, as material parts of my being. That the body is material, we all understand. In fact, we even know the chemical composition of the body. We also know the body just made of atoms and molecules. We know that after death, uh, the body just, whether you cremate it or you bury it, it just going to return to its primal elements. That's what is meant by dust returning to dust. So that the body is material, we can understand. But what about the mind? Hindus believe that the mind is also material, but made up of very fine matter, very subtle matter, a matter that cannot be seen through the naked eye. You know, we know that the ability of the human eyes to see things is very limited. There's only a certain range, certain frequency that we can see through the eyes. Similarly, the sound, there is only a certain frequency of sound that we can hear. And that's why cats can see a lot more than we do. They can see at night. We can't see at night. When it's pitch dark, we don't see anything. So our eyes have a limited range. We know, for instance, an isolated electron or a proton, the tiniest material particle, if we have a very powerful microscope, maybe we could see some of the subatomic particles. With the naked eye, we don't, we can't. And yet they are all material particles. So Hindus believe that the mind is also a material entity. And that is why it has to follow the laws of matter. And the laws of matter would mean that material particles come together at some point, there's a certain force that holds them together. And then when that force is dissipated, 
the particles become separated again. And that's why we say when things come together, that's composition. And then when that force that holds these particles together goes away, decomposition. That's why we speak about the body getting decomposed, that it was composed of particles and it became decomposed again. So similarly, one of the characteristics of material entities is that they have a beginning, they have an end, they change, we speak about evolution, things change, they, things get transformed. And all of these things occur with the mind as well. The mind also changes. We know the kind of thoughts we thought when we were little and the kind of uh, ideas we had, hopes and fears and desires were very different than they are now. And as we grow older, the mind will have different thoughts, different ideas. Sometimes the mind feels weak, sometimes it feels strong. So just as the body feels mind and body feels weak and strong, the mind also feels weak and strong. We will see if we think about it, that there is very little difference between the body and the mind. Everything that happens to the body happens to the mind. The body is strong, the body is sometimes weak, the mind is sometimes strong, the mind is weak. Uh, if you feed, um, if you put some nourishing food into the body, then the body becomes healthy. If you put some nourishing food for the mind, and the food for the mind is good thoughts, healthy thoughts, healthy ideas, and the mind becomes strong. If I put junk in the body, the body falls ill. If I put junk in my mind, the mind falls ill. So there is a physical illness, there is mental illness. And then both have their doctors. So we see pretty much everything that happens to the body happens with the mind as well. Except, except we see the body and we don't see the mind. And because both of them are material, they act and interact upon each other. And that's why modern science, even modern medicine sees that majority of the illnesses are psychosomatic in nature. In other words, body and mind act and interact upon each other. And we have, you must have seen that in our own lives. When there's extreme pain or the body is not well, or if you're ill, then the mind doesn't feel strong either. The mind kind of gets sad and depressed. And, and the other way also, when the mind is sad, then the body doesn't feel energetic as well. So there is this action and interaction occurring between body and mind. But now, besides the body and the mind, there is this third thing, the spirit. And that is non-material. And because it is not made of matter, it doesn't have to follow the laws of matter. So Hindus believe that the spirit is birthless and deathless, is eternal. The body is imperfect. The mind is imperfect. The spirit, always perfect. The body has its limitations. The mind has its limitations. The spirit, no limitations, it's always free. So right now, we are a combination, according to the Hindus, about this free spirit, which is eternal, filled with joy, and then the body and mind, which are wonderful also, but which have their limitations. So the body, the mind, and the spirit. Now spirit, Hindus see, is the source of all consciousness. So everything that I'm conscious of, when you look out of the window, here is, I have a beautiful window from my side and I can see the river, river from here. And I look out of the window and I see the river or I see a tree. Um, that awareness of the spirit, which is the source of all awareness. Now, I, it just feels right now as if my body is aware, my mind is aware. And what the Hindus say is that the awareness that, that my body has doesn't belong to the body. It belongs to the spirit. It's a little bit like um, the source of light and you cover it with the lampshade. And for you, you will see as if the light is coming from the lampshade. 
but actually the shade is only a covering. So Hindus see that the spirit is conscious and the mind and the body are coverings over it. And it's the light of consciousness coming from the spirit percolating through the mind, through the body and going out. And we mistakenly might think that the body and mind themselves are conscious, but consciousness doesn't belong to that. One other thing you will have quickly noticed that all of the differences we will see in people around us, in the world around us, are all these external. So we speak about gender differences, whether someone is male, female, or whatever other gender identifications we have, they are all connected with the body, the different way the body is configured. Then we speak about color. There are these color differences, people who are white, black, brown, and all different shades connected with the body. We can think about the mind. Sometimes some people we say the this person is very intelligent, some person is not so intelligent, or this person is kind. So qualities of the mind. So the differences we see among people, whether it's, whether it's in terms of the physical differences or differences in the mind and the intellect are all connected with either the body or the mind. As far as the spirit is concerned, there is no difference. So if we are sometimes look at the world and are able to appreciate the diversity around us, we should also remember alongside that, that in the midst of all this diversity, there is unity. And that unity is the unity of spirit. So I may look different. I may speak in a different language. I, I might be worshiping in a different way. I might have different cultural upbringing. And yet the spirit I have within me and the spirit that is present in every living creature. Hindus believe they don't limit it only to human beings. Every living being, even your dog and your cat, all the pets that you have, the animals, everything that is living has this spirit. And that spirit is identical. Among, among everybody. And so even as we navigate through life and celebrate this diversity, for instance, now today I'm sharing with you this festival of lights, the Diwali that the Hindus have. Similarly, there are festivals among in the Christian tradition, among the Jewish, among the Islamic tradition, among the Buddhist, among all these wonderful religious traditions the world over. These festivals, if we look, we can enjoy and celebrate them. And if we look deeply inside every one of these festivals, we will see the core. And that core is not different. That's where we share in common with all. Hindus have a, an imagery. They say that just as rivers, there are so many rivers, and all of these rivers start in different places they meander through different ways. I mean, ultimately, they all go and meet into the ocean. So while apparently they might seem to be very different, but the end result is they all meet into the ocean. And once they empty their waters into the ocean, if you go to the ocean, you cannot say, oh, this water is from this river and this water is from that river. It's all become one. And similarly, Hindus believe that right now we are all so many people and so different in so many different ways. But ultimately, the goal of life, the purpose of life, we will all go and there we will all meet. And therefore, if we keep this unity at the back of our mind, then we are able to enjoy this diversity around us. It's a little bit like um, going to different kinds a restaurant, you go to a, uh, a restaurant that serves Indian food or Mexican food or Italian food and all these different, we can relish the different um, recipes and different food, recognizing that 
it's possible to eat healthy food from these different traditions and make the body healthy. So what the Hindus say is, get to know whatever tradition you belong to, whatever tradition resonates with you as good, as well as you can. And then today we don't even have to go far to know about other traditions. We just look around, maybe among your friends, among if you, if you read books, if you watch some television programs, you immediately get to see in distant parts of the world or even near in our own neighborhood, we might find people speaking different languages and different religions and so on, and we get to know it. And what it does is besides enriching our own mind with these ideas, it's amazing how sometimes getting to know other religious traditions, we are able to then appreciate our own tradition in a better way. For instance, now, if we see oh, the idea of love, love of God, how do Hindus express their love for God? And then when we get to know about it and read about it, and then we might suddenly remember, oh, in my own tradition, this is how we pray. This is how we do it. And then it helps us appreciate our own tradition and also appreciate the treasures in other traditions. And that's the goal. And in some ways, I think today we are very lucky. We are very fortunate because in the olden days, if you go way back, in fact, not too way back either. I mean, even if you go maybe maybe 200 years ago or 150 years ago, pretty much people, wherever they were born, that's where they grew up, that's where they went to a school, that's where they started families, that's where they grew old, and that's pretty much where they died. Before jet travel came, before the internet came, I think many of you are young enough um, that you don't even know that the world existed before there were cell phones, before there were computers. Where when I was growing up, there were no cell phones, there was no internet. And well, we survived. So if you go back a little bit, you see that, and even before jet, I mean, when I when I was born, of course, there was jet travel. But but if you go back a hundred years or 150 years, there was no jet travel. It wasn't easy to go. There wasn't even railroad if you go 200 years ago. So it wasn't easy to go from one place to another. And therefore, the communities were pretty much very homogeneous. Pretty much people who spoke the same language and believed in the same, uh, they had same cultural values and same uh, religious traditions. They all kind of lived very isolated, insulated communities. But now because of ease of travel and, and such a, it's a global village as they say. And that is why to encounter diversity, we don't have to go very far. Now, if we have a closed mind, then this diversity can be very frightening. Can be, we might be afraid about it. We might be suspicious about it. We might um, have all kinds of weird ideas about it. And that's why sometimes people think, oh, what I do, what my thing, that's the best. Everything, everyone else who thinks differently is either wrong or bad. Now that idea will go away if we keep our hearts open and learn. Now, sometimes they say, keep your minds always open, but not so open that your brains fall out. In other words, that we should be open, but we should also be careful. You know, it's a little bit like, um, like in computers, you know, every time we go online, we are actually allowing outside traffic to get inside your device, your phone or your iPad or, or your tablet or your computer. But then we also have a firewall. We want to make sure that only good things, good data gets in. 
We don't want viruses to get in. Speaking of virus, we know already what happens. You know, virus enters inside the body. What havoc it creates. It's creating havoc all over the world now. So if these viruses enter the computer, then the computer will become unusable. And so we make sure that only good data gets in. Similarly, we are being careful now. And I hope all of you are being careful that you always wear a mask, maintain social distancing, because we don't want the virus to go inside. So that thing we have to take, be careful about. So even as we open ourselves to these great ideas from every direction, we have to make care, we have to be very careful that only healthy ideas, positive ideas, good ideas that will help me become a better human being, help me become a good, successful person, that I can be happy myself and I can have my family, my friends, the people around me happy as well. I become an instrument of peace and joy and happiness to everyone. So that's the ideal. So when you think about the festival of lights, it's not just about the external light. It's also becoming aware of the internal light. And what Hindus believe is that if I can live truthfully, honestly, if I work hard, if I try to think not just about me, 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 but also about those who are around me, the more unselfish I become, the more good I become, the more honest I become, that light in my heart will shine even more brightly. And when it becomes brightly, I will become happy and I can share that happiness with others. So that's the message of Diwali. That's the message of this festival to have these external lights, but also look within and make sure that that light of God, that light of goodness, that light of truth, that light of honesty, that light of unselfishness that remains shining brightly always in my heart. So I bring to you my prayers and my best wishes and greetings, not only from myself personally, and the Hindu community in Boston, but also from Hindus all over the world. And let's join our prayers together that the world becomes a better place to live in, that is filled with joy, peace, and contentment for everyone. Um, I'll be happy to, to take some questions or thoughts or comments that you have. Swami, thank you so much for all that you shared with us this morning. Mm -hmm. It gives us some good food for thought. Um, I have a question here from Vishnu Amani, who is a junior. And Vishnu asks, um, he says, many Hindus in the modern day claim that the Ramayana is outdated, especially with respect to progressive ideals. But at the same time, others wish to find philosophical importance in it. What place do you think these ancient texts can have in the daily lives of Hindus? I think every one of us should make an independent study of these texts and recognize the historical context. Many of these texts are several centuries old. They have patterns of behavior and patterns of uh, doing things that was appropriate for a social structure of those days. And because the society has changed, some of those things either may not make sense to us or may seem weird to us. So rather than if we can go beyond, go past these historical differences. If you go to the kernel of the matter, go to the heart of the matter, we will see there are very, very inspiring things that can continue to guide us and help us today. And I personally have found great benefit in the life of Rama. Because Rama was a king, was an administrator, and how did he administer his kingdom? How did he treat the people around? And that teachings, the, the way he did it, that is very relevant to us today as well. But Rama didn't have internet. Rama didn't have Zooms or any of these things. So he didn't do that, but we can do it now. So we see the, the, the essence of his teaching and find that it is as relevant now as it was then. 
So see if any other questions come in here from students or faculty, but I have a question for you um, in the meantime, Swami. So I know part of your role um, at Harvard at MIT is, is as chaplain of the schools um, and uh, in caring for young people, caring for undergrads and their spiritual health as they come to you. Um, these last nine months have been extremely difficult in a number of ways uh, for everyone. And I'm wondering if you have particular advice or particular um, spiritual nourishment <laughs> that you've sort of extended to young people as they navigate um, uh, this really hard time. Yeah, indeed, it is, it is hard. And many of the students I have spoken to, um, they, they have had difficulty because they cannot meet and meet with their friends as often as they did before. They can, I mean, it's still socializing is kind of possible over now, over, uh, over video chats. But it's still different than actually being in, in, in the company of friends. So that's something that needs getting used to. On the positive side, this also gives us an opportunity then to spend a little bit more time than we did before uh, reading books um, or, or reflecting over things. One of the things I often tell uh, my student friends is that when we are in the company of other people, of course, we feel happy. But sometimes when we are just by ourselves and being alone for a long time, then we tend to get bored. Um, sometimes we try to try to overcome that boring by um, that boredom by by you know going on the surfing the internet or listening to music and so on. But if we switch off all music, switch off your phone, switch off your television for a while, and just be by yourself, and then if you get bored, then we have to think a little bit. Because when I'm by myself, I have only myself for my company. And if I'm getting bored, that means my company is boring. I cannot withstand my own company. And if I can't stand my own company, what right have I to inflict it on other people? So if I want others, if I want my friends to enjoy my company, I need to enjoy my company myself. And, and to know whether I can enjoy my company, it's good to spend a little time every day just by yourself. That's one thing we can all do. A second thing, of course, is some really wonderful books. The, I have some uh, friends who are in the, in the book industry, uh, publishing industry, and they were saying how book reading has really become less. Uh, People are open to more kind of visuals uh, form of learning, but just picking up a book and reading, that habit is going down. And this pandemic, terrible as it is, and the amount of death and destruction it is doing, one of the things we can use this kind of enforced isolation that is upon us by just cultivating a habit. Even if you don't have the patience to sit and read a thick book, even to take up some good book and maybe just read a couple of pages at least, and then reflect a little bit on what you have read. I think that's also very helpful. So these are some of the ways. And of course, if you have interest in music, if you have interest in hiking, this will be a good time to go out. Again, have a good mask around you, keep special social distancing, but some of these habits will be helpful in uh, dealing with the forced isolation of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question here from Andres Wilson, who's a faculty member in the English department. Um, and Andres says, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, he says, I wonder if you might speak to the importance or threat of scriptural literalism in Hinduism. For example, is it useful to read a text like the Gita literally as well as figuratively or would such a reading be to the detriment of its spiritual teachings? Well, literally, as I said, the Gita now is by, according to Hindu uh, chronology, at least 3000 years old. I mean, it's really old. So if you take it literally, um, 
some of it may not make sense. Some of it may not have relevance to us today. So I think understanding its figurative sense of that teaching would be more beneficial than taking it literally. And in some sense, this kind of a debate exists not only in terms of with regard to religious scriptures, with even regard to in a, in a secular society, with regard to even a constitution, for instance. So, and there is no one definitive answer. So there are some uh, justices, there are some judges who believe you must literally take what the constitution says. And so there is this whole literalism. And then there are others who say, no, you have to interpret it to the existing times. So this um, debate or dilemma about historical texts, whether they are in their constitution of country or religious text, this debate will always exist. Now, some benefit definitely can come by looking at the studying literally and understanding what the text said then, but then to blindly apply it without any filter to the present times may not always yield the best result. So I think an interpretation is important. And the Gita, uh, like many of these old scriptural texts, has many commentaries. And we need new commentaries written in every generation to make sense of these texts to the societies of, of, of our, our own contemporary society. Thank you. I have a question um, from Ben Crawford, who's a senior. Um, Ben's question, uh, Ben says, you've mentioned the importance of books for you. Are there any books that you would recommend for everyone to read, regardless of faith or philosophy? Well, one book that um, is, is by Isabel Wilkerson, the Pulitzer Prize winning writer. It's a book called Cast, um, the source of our discontents. And I would encourage, it's, it's, it's a very fascinating read. And we know currently there is so much talk and debate and uh, ideas of, with, with what's happening about racism in the country. And her thesis is that there is this idea of caste. So Indians in Indian society had caste. She speaks about this, the kind of caste that existed in, the, in Nazi Germany and the black and white relationships in the country. And so she feels that understanding the historical context in, in the United States, um, the, the relationship of what happened to the black experience in the country is better understood through the lens of caste than through the lens of racism. So that's one of the books um, that I found. It's not religious per se, but the book makes us really think from the perspective of our own traditions, our own cultures. So that's one good book to study. Thank you. I have one more question here. I think that's all we have time for. Um, it's from uh, Paul Sugg, who's a member of our faculty in the science department. Paul says, um, can you explain the hierarchy within the Hindu religion similar to what exists in Christian religions if such a hierarchy exists? No, there is, there is no hierarchy because Again, in, I don't know, in Christian, even in Christian tradition, I don't know in what sense a hierarchy would exist. I mean, I mean yes, surely among the Catholics, there is, it's a very hierarchical structure. Uh, but but I, I don't think in every Christian denomination, probably every denomination has its own hierarchy, hierarchy thing. But Hindus are also very decentralized tradition. There is no, there is no one, there is no Hindu Pope, for instance. And so there is no hierarchical structure itself in the in the religious Hindu religious world. Swami, thank you so much for being with us here this morning. I think Mr. Brennan probably has a few remarks to um, to close us out here. Sure. Swami, I'm grateful for your insight, for your wisdom, for your generosity in being with us today. You, you not only in, inspire us by your words, but by your example. And each of us is searching in, in each of our lives for people who make us different, who make us better, who open us up to our best selves. And you are such a person, you've dedicated your life to that. 
we're just grateful that you could spend this time with us today. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Always have a good day. Thank you.